Gonna bet you. Nabamia Dachanup. Welcome back, everyone, to Rising Warriors, Rachel Kule. I'm Nabamia Dachanup, a woman that travels with the stars. I am affiliated with the Northwest Spanish Shoshone Nation, and I also come from the Nez Pierce, Osage, and Blackfoot people. And today I have Spirit, uh, no, Spring Spirit Nation podcast with Siquan Arcot with me today. And she is an educator. And so I'm excited to have her with us today as we're going to talk about some land education and uh, knowledge, um, you know, spreading, sharing some knowledge. So I'm going to have you go ahead and introduce yourself, um, introduce your people, where you come from and uh, share a little bit about yourself. Hey, that's it, Kakyo, no ago magantik. Sikona chak nisiga son, ataka go po chindia. Um, no taui, berry siga so go negawi, hazel. Um, nego toasik, the pamatuin. Um, nuigian. My name is Sikwan Achak, and that translates. To Spring Spirit, and I am from the Atakakoop First Nations, and my father is Barry, and my mother is Hazel, and I'm from the Treaty Six Territory in uh, Central Saskatchewan. Welcome. Very Love good it. to be here. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna. So actually, she has a po another podcast, and so what caught my attention with her is that I saw an, another Indigenous woman out here doing a podcast and I was like yes more <laughs> women because usually I'm seeing all these men out here you know the yep. indigenous men doing the podcast and so I was like we need to share the love and I was like we're going to spotlight you here today um, and what you're doing and things and help bring um, you know awareness to what you're doing with your podcast and education in the system and things that because you're doing a lot and <laughs> yeah. and I love it. And I love, you know, spotlighting those that I see that um, are really out here doing things, making a difference in um, Indian country, but not only that, uh, bringing awareness to other cultures and things like that and educating, you know, the world. And so I'm excited because when I saw you, I was like, yes, another indigenous woman. <laughs> we, we're going to support each other. Like, oh, yes. go. <laughs> so I'm excited. <laughs> so tell us a little bit um, just about how you actually got started and what what got you started with your podcast and kind of drove you into doing that. Oh, goodness. I say probably I think it was around 2015. I was a part of um, it was called. IOPS empowers women. So that's indigenous opportunities with Nathan Arias. And he just put a shout out, a call out about four years ago. And he was looking for four women to um, come together and interview guests and things like that. And all I did was like his post. I liked it. And I thought, because I have so many things going on in my life. Like um, back then I was uh, a master's student in education. Uh, I was teaching full time, you know, I was a single parent and I just liked his post. And then um, suddenly I was like one of the four. <laughs> so, what he, <laughs> so what he did was he um, um, across Canada, there were four of us that came together and uh, we had a good solid show. Uh, let me see. I think we had two shows a week. And uh, it was just so amazing because we were just pulling out people that uh, we wanted to empower and a lot of them, which was kind of unique, uh, didn't feel that they had a story. And we just pulled it out of them and what they were inspiring others without even knowing it, you know, because as Indigenous women, we have a tendency to, you know, quote unquote, do it all. And, um, you know, it's just become so normalized. And when other people see that, um, we don't know that we're actually inspiring people. So we right. pulled those stories out. And then we ended up receiving an award called an international award called One Woman. Mm. And um, a young lady named Mupumi was the one who presented the award. And she was sort of like handpicked from Oprah Winfrey, you know, to 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 do all of this amazing stuff around the world. Um, there are many people actually in the One Woman Um uh, group or whatever yeah, you yeah. Call it. yeah it was like it was unreal so we were recognized 
And uh, that was great. And we put it on pause for a while. And then um, Nathan um, sort of handed over our Empowers Women to another lady, uh, Glenna Henderson, who um, went forward with that. And then I used to tell him, <laughs> um, Nathan, I want a podcast again. Uh, and then I sort of whined to him. I said, well, you should have gave me uh, Empowers Women. But it's just like an inside joke between us. And he's like, uh, do it, do it, do it yourself. And I'm like, Okay, myself. What do I do? Where? Where? Okay, so I started um, in March um, when the lockdown first started in uh, for the, you know, the COVID pandemic. The COVID. Uh -huh. Everything locked down, and um, everybody like I'm an educator, and I teach in a high school, and that all went online, and it was so I don't know I can't like to explain it, it was like a heavy way to teach because there was just no communication no connection yeah and then um so i'd log off at the end of the day and um so what did i do i started a podcast and i'd log back on it. <laughs> i love it <laughs> i love it so my first guest was uh donnie rain and he's um i thought he would uh be a great guest because he's a, a traditional dancer and he is also a radio DJ host in Edmonton. Mm. So yeah, got my feet wet there and he was great and supportive and very, very patient. And then I just took off from there. <laughs> I love it. So on the education part, I want to touch on that part because my mom, she's also a professor um, at some of the universities here in Portland. And mm -hmm. so it was interesting watching her go through the transition of teach for her. She's so she teaches art. And so going from teaching class in, you know, person um, in person class with art and then having to all of a sudden learn and figure out how to teach art online and through oh. the computer. And it was, it was, you know, it was challenging for her to go through these things. And then all of the work that was put behind it, I don't think people really understand the extra work that you educators are having to do just to go through the online system and things like that. Right. Do you want to kind of like touch on that a little bit on like what you had to go through? Um, what, what were the things that you, what were your challenges that you kind of went through and then were able to overcome? Okay. So aside from your regular classroom day, you go to school and you prepare for class and you teach class and things like that. Like when we were started teaching online, we had morning meetings daily. You don't have morning meetings daily um, when you're in a school system. So that was taxing. Um, I don't know why it was a lot of the things were regurgitated and mundane and but you had to be there. I guess it was for attendance purposes, perhaps. But and then after that, you're um, teaching, you're reaching out to students, you're trying to make a connection for the ones that are at home. You can't imagine how the students are feeling on the other end. You know, um, who knows what uh, situation they may be in. Um, and on top of that, like at the beginning, there was a lot of fear, a lot of, of the unknowns and things like that, and what might be going through a little person's mind. So, um, so we had to make uh, connections. And then I kind of felt with the work that we were submitting online, like I was using Google Classroom, it was just like putting, like shoving it down their throat kind of thing. But then we sort of got together with our daily meetings um, uh, that we should create projects. Mm -hmm. where all subject areas are are coming in and then uh, it can contribute to that. So that worked out so much better. And it was sort of, um, I'd say, two weeks into the online teaching, we sort of like transitioned into that, which was more successful. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I give props to all you teachers out there that are – going through this new transition and things like that. Cause I don't think people thank you guys enough um, for the work that you guys are doing. Cause not everybody sees the extra work you all are having to do. And then <laughs> exactly superwoman. And you know, you 
And then not only that, if you have your own family and kids on top of that and, you know, trying to do everything. And then I can only imagine, too, with, you know, some stu uh, students and teachers with, you know, knowing about homes and the the stabilities of the homes that the, you know, the the, the placement and what's going on in the homes, you know, mm -hmm. can make things even more challenging because usually those are those times that you get to really help those kids and mm -hmm. have that one-on-one -on -one time. So for me, that would be, you know, challenging. I'm a, for, I'm a ballet teacher. And so I miss my ballet students. And so it's just like, it's not the same doing anything online um, yeah. versus having that one-on-one, -on -one, the eye contact, especially, especially as indigenous, you know, we're mm -hmm. used to that eye contact that, you know, yeah. feeling each other and being in that presence. And so it's, you know, I give you props for, for that. So what education, so what are you teaching? So you, you were, okay. you were talking about indigenous, the, the land and um, mm -hmm. educating on the land. So what, what got you into that? And where did you start from there to go down that road? Oh, goodness. Maybe about 10 years ago, I seen the trend. Um, I taught primarily in indigenous communities and my own home community as well. And then I moved to um, another Indigenous community, and they're Moniao community. Um, that's our uh, the Western uh, form of education. Uh -huh. uh, we started something called land-based education, and uh, I was intrigued. I attended a session, a free session, to listen to see how they're doing it. And what they did was they took students to the far north for two weeks and immersed them into the land and brought them back. And I thought, that is amazing, you know, we, should, we write, uh, we teach curriculum, right? Um, you know, that's uh, set out by the province and, you know, t uh, students have to pass tests and uh, reach, obtain those test scores and, and what have you, like for you guys, it would be um, state exams and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we have to prepare them. And here, these Munyawak, I thought, that's what we do. That's what we do like after school in our weekends and our summer holidays, what they did during school and went north. So then I seen the trend and then um, I sort of observed them for a year and I thought that's really great. You know, to me, it was like a foot in the door of something that could be really huge. And the University of Saskatchewan was offering a, a master's program in that exact thing in land based mm. education. So. Um, Dr. Alex Wilson was our professor. There were um, about, I can't even remember. Sorry, classmates. <laughs> there were about 20, 20 of us that were enrolled-ish. Yeah. Anyways, um, so um, they have an intake every four years or every two years. And it just happened to be the year um, for me to apply to um, become a master's student and I got in and what was amazing about that is that I'm um, second generation to obtain that master's degree in that exact program <laughs> oh good. that's awesome <laughs> that's an honor for your family yes so my mother uh, did that ahead of me and, and I came in a few cohorts later so um, it was really different a lot of that touched on uh, the academia part of uh, land-based education so that I was able to utilize a lot of the language in that aspect. But we, what was um, super cool was that we were actually out on the land. And um, one of the most greatest experiences of my life was canoeing. Like the whole cohort was canoed from a place called Nipwin, which is mm -hmm. uh, around Prince Albert, all the way to the next province. Um, to Opasquayak, Manitoba. Wow. So we were on the Churchill River, the Saskatchewan River. Uh, it was amazing. And we cooked out there and ate out there. And um, really unique experience for me because I'm a Plains Indian. Mm -hmm. I live by a lake, but that I could never, um, unless, you know, I live north or um, I live in a different land base, I would have had a, a different experience. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So as far as like land based, what do you focus on? So it's so I, it's actually, what do you focus on? And then also for those that don't really understand what the land based education, especially from an indigenous point of view, 
let's educate them. So if you're walking into a brand new class and I'm sitting down as a student and you're going to talk to me about land-based education, what would you say to me? Okay, I'm going to utilize a class that I got to teach a few years ago where 85% of the time we were out on the land during a school year and 15% of the time we were in the classroom where they were uh, where I was uh, teaching math and English uh, okay. two core subjects. So um, for 85% of the land, we were out there and it would be out there where I would tell you um, what's expected. And a lot of it would be respect for the land to start with. Um, my first class that I had with them, uh, they, uh, my superiors, my administration said, throw out that curriculum. I was like, what? <laughs> mm. Throw out the curriculum. Take this. We compile this, this, this information from the elders, the local elders. This is what they feel is important for that grade level to learn. Mm. And it was amazing. Um, a lot of it uh, had to, it, it, it just all came down to the values, right? Um, honesty, kinship. Uh, trust, love, happiness. And, um, but, you know, it was all indigenized. Um, not really, because that's pan Indian. It was uh -huh. Nehioized, I will say, because uh -huh. I was, I am Nehio. Um, a lot of people refer to us as Cree. But um, if you asked a Cree person, who are you, they would say I am Nehio. So Nehio, in the Nehio community. So I had Nehio knowledge and um so, you know, if you talked about taking the students berry picking, um, what what berries in what seasons and with that, you're not really teaching them about berry picking. You're actually uh, um, offering an experience. And with that, when you're just sitting there and you're like my day plan, you know, usually a teacher would write at nine o'clock. We're doing this math drill at 10 o'clock, blah, 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 blah. When I'm right. out there. Um, when I was out there, I was only required to journal everything that happened. So there's a lot of data in that um, respect that was compiled. And what I found when you took a, a child out to berry pick, of course, you're offering that experience, you're offering that knowledge. But what is happening is that the students are engaged with each other. They're talking with each other. They're counseling each other. They're um, teaching each other what their grandparents said and what their kukum said or um, auntie or uncle or what have you. So it was very, very dynamic, you know, with one simple lesson. Mm -hmm. And that would take the whole day because we were walking to these places and um, it was uh, quite an experience. So that's what it, 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 it is, is you're offering the experience. And um, when you've got the knowledge, um, as an Indigenous person, as a Nehio person, you know, we got to um, re reawaken that knowledge of offering tobacco to the or for the plants and, you know, the, the protocol. Um, not my favorite word, by the way, but, right. you know, just to go about that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just to go about that uh, for the people. And, of course, uh, there's guidelines set out for the elders, uh, from the elders, and um, it just was so, it was such a great experience to do that. I love it. So what other thing besides berry picking, what what was some other things that you would take them to go do? Fishing. Oh, gosh, there was uh, rock picking. Um, we got, you know, there was a lot of geology involved there, geography, you know, just going out and picking the rocks, um, the ancient stories of the rocks. Um, we've got a, a story of twin brothers, you know, and then from there we could incorporate that into a sweat lodge, which is um, the closest English word I can find for these lodges are mnemonic devices because the kids were asking, how did we remember so many things, you know, uh, being um, a whirlwind in, in a colonial system, you know, they don't, they're a lot of questions like that. How did we remember some? It's okay. So when you take them to a lodge, you talk about the rocks, and then from there you're you're looking at the different types of sweat lodges and the, and the positioning and the governance systems and the structures. So it's it's very vast. But the thing is, I wasn't I didn't go in there saying, okay, well, I'm going to 
uh, today is about rocks and it's going to go here. It was wherever the students wanted to go. So um, when they have their own genuine interest in something, they're going to learn it. So if I had an intent to going in, they're going to learn this. Um, it would, I probably would have created disappointment and with that comes judgment or whatever. But when you allow the students to lead it, um, they're genuinely interested. So that particular group were interested in the water filtration systems, everything to do mm -hmm. with the water. So we took them fishing. Uh, we picked the medicines around the river systems, the water structures, a lot of hiking. Um, just uh, how to you know, how to build a fire out in the snow, and it it, it was just what they uh, where they were interested in. But I didn't go in saying, "Okay, kids, what are you interested in?" It was like just the observing and watching. So then we were like honing that, and then uh, we would uh, give them the tools and you know, have assistance. And what was cool too, is that that particular class had two teachers. It mm. had a male team and a female. So we were together and, you know, it, it was like, it was like more complete, right? Yeah, the balance. And then, yes, it was more balanced. And then I can never forget about the people in the middle, right? Um, right. That, that, that hold us together. So it was really, it was uh, an amazing experience. And um, so I'm working in a new school division now and I was hired because of that experience, mm. but it's in a colonial system. So now I'm trying to balance it where there are indigenous students that attend. So <clears throat> I'm finding that there are um, barriers, I guess you could yeah. say is where, you know, it's just a little, a lot more paperwork and things like that to get the students out there, even um, building a fire in the schoolyard. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, good luck. They're like, <laughs> I had to get all kinds of permission from everywhere. <laughs> Let the fire department know, like, <laughs> have the fire marshals there. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when I was, um, in that, um, in the fully immersed, like the 85% immersed uh, land-based class, I looked up over the hill and I seen about 30 of my students, right? We had two vans, 30 of my students. And I was thinking, these students all have tobacco, you know, like in another school system that might not be kosher, right? Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. I was thinking, all of these kids have sharp objects in their heads. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing but they were all picking sage that day uh they were learning the different types of sage but they were they were at it and they were working and they were amazing <clears throat> I, I just I love gathering that's one of my favorite things is gathering and it's just so funny because um once you start gathering for a certain period of time, it's almost like you start hearing them talking mm -hmm. and like, you'll be gathering and then you hear, pick me, pick me, pick me. And it's like, they know, it's like, they know that they're going to be used for this medicine. And so, you know, they, if you're in tune, you'll start to pick up and you'll start to hear which medicines. And then I love too, is like when you don't really even know what medicine that could really be, if you're in tune enough and you sit with that plan enough, they'll start talking to you and they'll start showing you, you know, what they're used for. And that's a lot, you know, what our, our ancestors did with these herbs, they would sit with these herbs and, you know, talk with them and okay, show me how to use you, show me how to prepare you and, you know, different things like that. And one thing I want to touch on though, real quick is that, a lot of people too, when they go and gather and pick, they forget to leave some for others. Mm -hmm. And, and so like one thing I was always taught with gathering is, so say you have a, a bunch of, I don't know, chamomile or something. So you have a big, big bunches of chamomile. You don't go and just go and pick all of that chamomile. You maybe go pick a couple branches from each little pile of it and you leave some for others to come and gather too. And so that's the thing is that we as indigenous know is like we we don't take it all. You don't take it all. You take what is needed at that moment in time. You give that offering with, and say with the tobacco, that's that sacred um, medicine and offering. So we give that tobacco to the offering of the land. 
and saying, you know, thank you. And we're honoring you and, um, you know, in a good way so that however we use this medicine, we're taking it in a good way. We're using you in a good way. We're giving back to you. We're not just taking and taking and taking. There's, there's this exchange of, of thanks, but then when you're sitting there gathering, it's a whole nother connection that you get that I love. And that's what that, what your students are feeling too, is, you know, they're Mm -hmm. feeling this connection to the earth. They're feeling the connection with the plants and then it connects them more. Then it brings that laughter and that joy. And it's almost like those memories of the ancestors with those plants start coming up and then they start sharing these stories that, you know, they would not have talked about in this, in a classroom setting or Mm -hmm. out in the play, you know, in the playground or something something like that. It's, you know, they weren't set in that setting to go into that place to be able to um, like educate each other, counsel each other, like you were mm-hmm. saying. And right. so I think, I think that's, it's beautiful. And I, I wish, you know, more schools and things would eventually, I hope, you know, eventually one day um, it'll go down that road of more schools um, uh, outside of the reserves, you know, educating mm-hmm. on this, in this way because it helps connect the spirit too and we're we're living in this world of like disconnect and so if especially for indigenous it's important that we reconnect and so i i'm i love that you know all of this new education especially with the land and herbs and this knowledge is coming it wasn't really accessible um when i was growing up the way it is now and so it's kind of like, now I'm like, okay, where are the educators? I want to like, can I go back to school? Like, <laughs> so do you do, do you ever do workshops and things like that for, um, adults college? Um, I've started to, um, not so much, but I feel that I'm, I'm going into that direction. You know, it's like, sometimes you're, you're, you're just living life and you're like, um, I don't know anything. You know, what, what do I know? Like, uh, but it's just so normal. It's your life. And then there are other people and they're like, uh, what does sweetgrass look like? What does, what did we use as a pain reliever? And then you're like, okay, you're answering that question. And you're like, okay, I, what's, um, I think kind of cool about me is that my traditional education, my indigenous knowledge came from primarily my dad and, um, the, the terminology that I learned was in the, in the Hiawe one. So, Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love that because I'm able to share the knowledge yet, um, uh, protect the knowledge, uh, acknowledge the knowledge. Um, but when someone asks me about things, that's how I transfer the knowledge as well as the way I learned. So if, um, you know, there's scientific words now for, uh, sweet grass and, right. you know, just different things like that. No, you're going to uh-huh. get, if you're talking to me, <laughs> you're going to yeah. get the <laughs> a word for it. And, and what would uh, that word be? What's the word for sweet grass? Wikasqua. 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 Yeah. Wikasqua. Right. Uh, like I love it. See, I love <laughs> when you're when you teach in the native in the tongue. Um, it's it's more powerful. And like you said, you're keeping that alive too. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. keeping your language alive. You're keeping the that your ancestors alive too, in that sense, by by speaking with that too. I I love that. And, you know, it's for me, I, I really uh, honor those. I'm learning my language. My grandma was um, she didn't from school and things and trauma growing up. Uh, she was she didn't really speak Shoshone. And so it was like when we got around family and stuff like that, that's when she spoke Shoshone. But in home, she never really did mm-hmm. until the last you know few years of her life. But. So I'm going back and, you know, re-educating myself and learning my language. So I have, you know, I have like respect and, you know, for those that were able to keep, keep that language going, especially through colonization and things like that. Mm -hmm. So how is your dad? Like he, he learned these medicines. So what's his, you know, what's his little journey and story of, his you know the medicine and how that was passed down traditionally through your family okay so um he 
was one of the ones that never attended residential school. And um, he, his, he was raised by his great or his grandparents. So he never attended residential school. And he actually, he said though, when the students were away, it was one of the loneliest times of his life. So he didn't have a lot of peers to, to, to play with. Um, uh, just thinking of a video I watched with him last night where he, where he was asked uh, if he, uh, what toys he played with as a child. And he was, he just said, I ran in the hills, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <Yeah. laughs> so he didn't have a lot of peers. And what happened to him, uh, you know, just happenstantially is that he um, got to sit with his grandparents and his grandparents had a lot of visitors um, who were older than them, you know, coming to share knowledge about um, uh, locations, constellations, plants, um, the ceremonies, lodges and things like that. And so he, he, he um, listened and that's how he learned. Mm, and then you, he taught you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, so through COVID and things like that, what have you guys been doing as far as wellness and teas or things that you've been eating? Um, what are some things that have been helping you guys through that and from your guys' plants? Because I know we all have different um locations and different herbs to our tribes and things like that but for specifically for you because i have a lot of um people on here that's from your your clan so mm -hmm. um what what are some things that you've been doing okay so keep yourself healthy <laughs> we knew lockdown was coming right it there was like uh, they the the province had a date and 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 this was like back in april march um, things were coming and then my dad just uh, loaded, loaded us all up and he took us to the river and he he showed us a tree that um, he called he he taught us that's called Muskom Nanatik and um, so we were out there we didn't have a chainsaw <laughs> we weren't that prepared just yet oh, no but no. we did have the, we did have like the hand saws and things like that so we we're out there uh -huh. and uh, we gathered this this um, muskum nana thick, and then it was in my whole living room, like where I'm sitting right now. And uh, we worked on it for a good month. We just, it was in the drying process. We were peeling the bark. We were um, working with it. And at the same time, you know, um, it, it would be called learning in situ, you know, um, uh -huh. watching my dad uh, teach, a, um, uh, teach my children. And then I'm like, everyone's learning about this particular medicine. And he we he taught us that it was a what a medicine that was acquired and required by the people uh, Nehio people at the time of the Spanish flu, and it was for the lungs. So we didn't know a lot about the coronavirus at the time, but we did know that it 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 attacked the lungs because you know um, knowledge was limited then, and it was like going off right. in tangents. You didn't really know, but we knew it was for the lungs. So that particular medicine is what we worked with. And then um, as time went on, um, we started adding more things, um, you know, uh, the medicine to bring the fever down, you know, we added the medicine um, that empowers uh, certain medicines and um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cause I, for me, I've been doing a lot of different things and um I, you know, I, I also went to school for herbology. So I, I, I like um, the Ayurvedic medicines as well. And mm -hmm. so I do different healing modalities. And so for me, I was bringing in a lot of the different uh, Ayurvedic mixed with um, traditional, you know, native herbs and things like that. And the, one of the biggest things I've, I've been using is like the um, bear root, the Osage or yeah. yeah. Yeah, Osha? Osage root, Osha root, Osage, Osha yeah. root. Yeah. So I've been using a lot of that and um, like Molin, because uh, Molin's everywhere around where I'm at over here. So I love doing that one. Um, and then uh, smoking the Molin too can be really good for pulling uh, pneumonia and mucus out of the deep parts of the lungs. So there's all these different natural ways of healing and remedies and things like that and were you you were saying that you do another different healing modality yeah on top of everything else um i'm a theta healer 
and I am an access bars practitioner. So that's uh, combined with with um, the traditional knowledge. It's actually um, gave me words. You know, sometimes, you know, with the traditional knowledge, like a lot of times it's more of an energy, it's a feeling, it's a vibration, it's an essence. And to be able to put that into words is, um, could be a stretch. And mm -hmm. so with access bars and theta healing, um, there are, um, I found um, the Monia words to, uh, to enhance, not enhance, but to, you know, to accommodate what was missing, utilizing the English word. Right. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> you know? No, I, I understood what you said. <laughs> that makes sense. It's true. Because there's, if you look at the native language, indigenous language, there's a lot of, like, one word could actually be a paragraph in yeah. English. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you're describing things in, in ways and whatnot. And so... Yeah, it, it can be very difficult to translate because I even do that with like with my boyfriend. He'll be like, what does that word mean? And I'm like, OK, hold on. It means and it's like this huge, long paragraph. Right. And so <laughs> it's like it's it, but it's the same thing. He's, he's Cuban. And so it's like same thing in like his language, too. There's words in there that, you know, it's you can't really translate it in English. So mm -hmm. you have to go and learn different um, language within English, if you want to say, right. to be able to translate um, words from indigenous language. So it's not this big, long paragraph. And so you can try to put it down into a couple words. It's <laughs> challenging. Mm -hmm. It can be challenging. So, so what's been, um, what's been really um, like amazing here is that I can run bars. Like we have a house next door. That's sort of where we go for, to eat. It's, uh, it's kind of communal, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so this is my house and uh, my brother's house is next door and he's the one that cooks up all the supper and the food and whatever. And um, Theta Healing, if uh, should anybody need it, I can do it from a distance and uh, which I have done already. And with the access bars, you know, with people that are in my immediate house, I'm able to uh, access 32 points on the head and um, create a lot uh, more possibilities, I guess you could say. And what it does is it, it kind of like defragments the brain as a computer would be defragmented. So if uh -huh. uh, people are having like, ah, moments or they're, um, you know, just a lot of stuff is just in their minds, you know, and that could just kind of create an imbalance to depression or, you know, um, putting um, unknown substances in your body or right. whatever, you yeah. know, just all kinds of stuff that society is, um, is uh, kind of doing when you're get your, your bars run, it creates possibilities. So when things are defragmented, it leaves room for more, right. More mm -hmm. possibilities. Mm -hmm. And you just, um, leave like some people have, have said that they felt like they're just walking on clouds after you know they're just amazing they're I've had people crying um, on my on my like my chair that I work on crying 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 and to no crying to uh, wanting to live again you know it's just mm. I have people <laughs> started people have come in with limps and, and aches and pains and they're they're gone right and right out of that is it's just directing the energy and their body knows what it wants so I like that because you don't go in with an intent oh I'm going to heal this person's uh, diabetes or what it's just right, whatever right. the body wants right so right. each session is different like the body is going to want something different each session so it's a new experience every time I love that because I, I do that. Um, I do vibration sound therapy. And then I also do another healing modality of um, body emotion code. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's the same thing that you're talking about with like working with the vibration, working with the energy of, of, you know, these people and releasing these negative energies, re restoring the balance in the body. And it, it's really amazing when, especially coming from indigenous point of view, bringing those traditions 
and mm -hmm. combining it with that together it's like they they go hand in hand and mm -hmm. they they work well together and it's the because we already know about the healing modalities of being able to work with somebody and then with medicine men we know that we can work on a on a energetic level through universe and through distance and um not having to have be right there with that person even to go through these these healings but being able to work on that subconscious level and that's you know what we as indigenous that's what these medicine people that we've been doing for a long time is working on the subconscious level working on what the spirit needs to release working on what the spirit wants and it's not what us as you know the the orchestrator as you want to if you want to say um and we don't go in there like having it like okay we're gonna work on this today and mm -hmm. we're gonna like um, we're gonna work on your ptsd we're gonna snack your you know depression out of here <laughs> sometimes it like will go completely opposite in a whole nother direction if mm -hmm. if you go in that way so it's really you know you have to really know how to be in tune in that sense too and that's the same thing like what you were saying with your class that you do that's a healing in itself and so it's like you can't you can't really plan what you're going to teach it's it's always going to be different you can have an idea of you know from intuition of where it may go and where it could orchestrate and like you know kind of go and where to start putting things into place but even then you don't even really know until you get there and you arrive. And then that's mm -hmm. when all of these things start happening. And then um, being able to go through with that flow, you know, and mm -hmm. not, and not have control and just be that tool. And, yeah. and, you know, so that, I think that can be challenging with some people too, that don't really understand yeah. that is that when it comes to these healings, you're a tool and oh, it's always not done. always what you think or what you want. And so then you're just going to create more frustrations through trying to help people heal. If you're trying to, yeah. get, you know, conduct the whole thing and take control over the whole thing. It mm -hmm. doesn't work like that. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So we were asking earlier about uh, land-based education and what it is yeah. that I do and where I would like to go Um is I know that there are a lot of actually really amazing land-based educators out here now, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And um, what's happening is they're taking them out on the land, you know, they're getting a moose and they're teaching them how to skin the moose and uh, prepare the meat and um, all of that really good stuff. That's just one small example. But what I'm looking at is what, you know, especially after you know, the, the other healing modalities is the mm -hmm. energetic part of it all. Yeah. You know, so, so um, there's not a lot of um, literature on that. I'm sure that an elder um, has a ton of knowledge about that, but that is kind of where I want to go because we've got, I actually was going to show you a book. There's a book here. Um, uh -huh. There's starting to be some written material now on land-based education and, uh -huh. uh, it's seasonal and, and things like that. And um, it ties in with uh, something called TP teachings. And I remember when I was younger, I asked my dad when we were putting up a TP, I said, dad, what TP is that? What TP pole does that re represent? And he just went, huh? Mm. I said, is that the, the honesty pole or the kinship pole? And my dad said, do you want to know really what that pole is? <laughs> I said, oh, uh -huh. I said uh, didn't say anything. I just listened. And he said, uh, that's one of the moons. And both people, both, both everything's different. That's when I realized when it is, depends on who you are as an individual. When you look at that lodge, if you're looking at it from, uh, if you're an astronomer, if you are, you know, a social worker, like per se, these are not the monial words yeah. for it. Yeah. Or if you're an educator, that will mean something totally different, but they're all right. And it's all like, uh, it starts to turn into multi-dimensions uh, as a part of the learning. So that really opened up my eyes to that. And when someone talks about the TPT uh, poll teachings, um, my mind goes, you know, there's yeah. like a lot more, not just 
uh, honesty, love, faith, you know, all of it's like huge and it's a vast. And in, in between there is just all that energetics and the connections, right? It's just, yeah, that's, that's where I want to go. I think I, I would like to uh, really work on that more in the future. I love it. I love it. I love what you're doing. So we're going to wrap this up here, but if there's um, something that you would like, like a message um, to leave, um, let's leave with a message and what, whatever that would be to you that you would like to share. All right. So my name is Sikwanachak and that means spring spirit. And I was born in January and in Saskatchewan, that is the coldest coldest month of the year and what happened was um, when I was born before I was born my dad received a message saying that you have another one on the way and my dad said I just had one you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so with that um, they my dad said well how how do you know like give me a message or a sign show me a sign kind of thing and um, my dad was quite young and they said I'll send you a sign. So when I was born in January, everything melted. People were canoeing down the streets of our capital city. And uh, they they told my dad her name will be Spring Spirit. So, um, so with that, I just uh, melt and warm the hearts of everyone that I meet. <laughs> yes, you do. You have a beautiful spirit. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I Thank appreciate you what you're here. doing out here and keep going sister. And I'll see, I'll keep supporting you too and sharing your stuff and go check her out as uh, spring spirit, spirit nation podcast. And aren't you on anchor as well? Yes. I'm on anchor Spotify of uh, seven different podcasts, podcast platforms. Yeah. The, yeah the, they <laughs> kind of like boosted out there. It's oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So thank you again for coming on Us, and, you know, it's been an honor, pleasure to have you on today and thank you for sharing, you know, your knowledge and education and um, go ahead and follow her. I put her uh, tags and things like that in the bio and we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Oh, have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs> I, keep I keep forgetting Christmas is coming. And oh, so. yeah. <laughs> I'm so lost on time right now. <laughs> All right. See you guys later. Thank you. Have a good Bye day. Steph.